Okay, shall we start? Yeah, now I want to. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, departmental session of the Graduate Open House at the University of South Florida. Uh, my name is Simon O. I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. I'm also the Graduate Program Director. Uh, today with me uh, is Jessica Brood. Uh, she's our Graduate Program Specialist. I'll ask Jessica to also say a few words of welcome to, to all of you. Okay. Jessica. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jessica Pruitt. I'm the Graduate Program Specialist. Um, I've been working here since February of 2019 and I took over this position at the beginning of 2020. Um, basically, I just help you if you need permits, uh, questions about registering, any kind of forms for the department, I would be your first contact for that. And um, nice to meet you all. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. And I should also add that Jessica will be the person that you would correspond to if you decide to apply to our department and you'll probably get emails from her regarding the application. OK, so uh, I hope people have uh, had a, you know, a good first 30 minutes uh, listening to our dean and welcome. And I really appreciate everyone uh, spending the time with us so we can go over our graduate programs with you. But let's first start maybe with a few uh, you know, uh, discussions and it, 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 it's really uh, uh, it, it's really a, a little bit uneasy because we are doing this online, so I cannot really see how many people are in the audience, are in the room. Um, but I assume many of you are thinking about graduate schools, right? and you may be considering applying, or you or you may have been thinking about this for a while. Uh, here are some problems that you may have you know, touched upon. Uh, along the way, uh, why do I want to pursue a graduate degree? Right? Is it just because I can get, get paid better when I graduate, uh, or I just want to have more challenges in my life? I want to, you know, you know, do things that are challenging that 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 would make me excited. Uh, maybe that's because the type of career that would, would follow would be different than the one that I like after I get go to graduate school and graduate. And then you may have also be thought been thinking about should I pursue a PhD or master's? Uh, is PhD for me or master would be a better fit? And obviously, you know, which university should I apply to? Okay. So I like to offer a few of my own perspectives and apparently you will think I'm, I'm biased. Uh, you know, probably I am, but, but I want to try to tell you what I would tell my own students uh, for those questions if they come to ask me them. Okay. So let me see, I can play my slide. There we go. Okay. So why graduate school? And there is a very interesting documentary that I would encourage you to watch. Uh, if you Google this title, you need not apply. It, it was produced in 2014, six years ago. It's very informative. Uh, in some sense, it's also a little scary to many people. Uh, so the, the bottom line of that movie is to say, well, a lot of the jobs that we actually, you know, have been you know, taken granted so we can actually learn some skills. Uh, we you know, uh, find a job after we graduate from college or graduate school, and we can use them for a lifelong career. Those days are over. Right? And one of the reasons that these are over is many jobs, uh, if not all of them, are at the danger of elimination by automation. Right? So we see a lot of you know, headlines on how advanced artificial intelligence can all be. Uh, you know, we have the autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars coming on the horizon. And, you know, many things that used to be mundane and repetitive, you know, have, have to be done by humans, uh, cannot be done by computers. And this, the, the collection of jobs that can be automated just grow, you know, bigger and bigger. And so that means, you know, we, we have to rethink about what we want to get from our learning in a higher education. It's no longer that you want to learn some skills you can use for a lifetime, but rather to enable you to learn new things or be, uh, I would say, automation safe right? uh, in the, in the, in the long, longer term. Like we're not seeing, uh, seeing in terms of 
10 or 20 years, you may have to think about learning new things every couple of years, right? every five years to be able on the cutting edge. And this also applies to the jobs in the computing field as well. If you think, well, we are safe because we are the people who actually, you know, push all this automation programming, you know, so our job should be safe. Well, in some sense, it is much safer than the more traditional jobs. But on the other hand, the elimination of jobs in computing comes in a different shape. Right? It's not that the whole, you know, job, the field is going to be replaced, but rather is the shape of the field is morphing very rapidly. So you probably all know this very well from your school. You consider new things, new languages, new frameworks, you know, new um, software tools you have to learn every so often. Uh, what you learn in school, I can assure you in five years, you know, there are newer things to replace them, right? So that means even though the jobs are not going to be disappearing, but how you do the jobs may be very different uh, than what you have learned in school. So it's really important what it's not what you learn the specific skills or techniques that you have learned, but rather you know, how you look at things, how you think about things, how you be more creative. Right? And this is how you make your career and jobs you know, automation safe. Right? And, and I would say this is really probably not a good way to think about it. Right? So automation safe is really the low bar that you want to you know, uh, aim for. Right? So what do you really want to aim for is to have a rewarding experience in what you do. Now, there's an old saying that if you love what you are doing, you don't have to work a single day. Right? So I, and I, I hope all of you can have that kind of uh, career and jobs you know, in the future. So you just love it so much, you don't even feel you are working. Right? Now those jobs are typically require direct human relationship. And so I have to say my job, uh, for you know, that category because you know teaching advising is inherently uh, you know it's a very human centered uh, I don't think you know by any chance uh, not not even close a machine or AI can replace a human in that kind of you know job right uh, forever right and also these good jobs that are you know that would be you know give you that kind of sen sense of achievement uh, is the one that require a degree of creativity that cannot be produced by AI. Right? So in some sense, if your job has a lot of creativity, then that's already automation safe. You don't have to worry about being replaced, but rather you'll be cutting, you know, cutting, you'll be actually pushing the envelope to creating the next thing that can actually be to make other jobs more efficient or more you know, productive. And most importantly, these are jobs that you feel most passionate about. Uh, if you have the passion, then you'll be successful. Right? So these are my, my take on, uh, on, on that point. Right? And these three are actually complementary. Right? So they actually they, they are looking from different angles about the same, the same thing. So I would say graduate education is one way you can get it. It's not the only way. Many people become very successful without a graduate education, but a graduate Education is one way that can help you get to that point. Okay. So, uh, so next quick question. Well, well if, if you really want to go, think about, okay, I really want to go to graduate school. Well, there's this PhD and masters. So, which one is for me? Uh, which one would make more sense for me? This is a really a highly individual decision, and both can help you achieve your career goals uh, if if you do it right. Um, but there is a myth uh, that you may have heard, uh, which is, you know, PhDs are only for people who like to do research. If you want to want to work for industry, you don't need to have a PhD. Now, this may be true. I would say in the uh, up to maybe in the early to middle two two thousand, right? you know, 10, 15 years ago. Okay? but it's definitely not true anymore. Like I, I can tell you from my, uh, you know. I started my faculty job in 2006, so it has been almost 15 years. Um, I have seen uh, my students who earn PhDs, they have gone to work on all kinds of industry jobs. Uh, so only actually, I would have, have to say, maybe a, you know, a smaller fraction go to on a research career like faculty members or, uh, or going into a company's research labs. 
the vast majority of them were really, you know, you know, uh, you know uh, sought after by all kinds of companies who are actually, you know, building products. You know, they have their own business. They need a PhD level education in you know, all kinds of positions. Uh, some, you know, went to startups. Uh, you know, can be very can do very well. But then there are also many people who just, you know, went to, you know, what I say, the established companies, and they actually. Especially in our field, in the field of computing, the the PhD is actually very important these days, you know, more than ever. Okay. So in terms of time frame, uh, the PhD normally takes anywhere I would say average five, but I have seen people who graduate in four years, but as long as six, seven, or even longer. Uh, but I think I would say the probably average is about five years if you go to any. Good universities, you probably are looking at that time frame in computer science or related fields for PhDs. Uh, masters, about two years. Uh, some one can get it done sooner than others, but roughly about two years. So the question is, well, what am I getting from the much longer time in PhD? So, uh, and again, right, so my uh, opinion is my opinion, uh, but, but I, but but I think these are pretty, uh, pretty true, right? So to get the level of capability that I mentioned early on, right? So to be able to be creative, to think critically, uh, to identify future problems before they even emerge, people even know there's a problem there down the road. The training that PhD offered is to to achieve that capability, and it takes time. Okay? So it doesn't happen. You know, very quickly, you need to work on substantially uh, challenging research problems to cultivate that capability. And it does work. Uh, so most of the you know, people I have observed, you know, especially PhDs from under a good advisor, they actually did, they mature very well. So if you look at them at the very, when they, when, when they begin, you know, the way they look at about things to identify problems, to find creative solutions, uh, how to, you know, analyze things. And then you, you, you compare that person on that entry point until the close graduate to defend. It's a huge difference. Okay. And that time is needed, uh, five to six is needed to achieve that. That's not to say you cannot gain something uh, through a master. Yes, you can. Uh, but I will say there's a qualitative difference about what you can gain through a PhD and then through a master's. Right? So you, you will gain something useful through a master's, but it will be you know, you know, significantly different and more uh, meaningful, I would say, if you, if you go through the PhD pro program. But again, right, this is a totally a personal uh, decision. There are a lot of things that I have to put into the consideration, right? So, you know, do you have family obligations? Right? So, you know, those kind of things. Right? So, what, what is the longer term plan in, in terms of, you know, starting a family, for example? Right? These are all part of your consideration. Um, and also, it is tough, right? It is a tough road to get PhD. Right? So, um, you know, and then during that period of time, you're know, you not being paid that much compared to people who. You know, graduate early to go into the industry, but you're more looking at the longer term, you know, benefit that you can gain for yourself. Okay, so uh, yeah, so by the way, we, we do have a Q and A session in in the end, right? so I'll be sticking around until about five twenty five five thirty. So yeah, uh, because we we don't we cannot really this platform doesn't allow us to uh, allow people to interrupt me to ask questions, so we just have to wait until the end. But if you have any question, you want to get a quick answer, you can type them in in the Q&A, there's a Q&A button in Teams, and Jessica is watching the, those question channels. If there are some questions that she can answer, she will answer them away, um, but then others, uh, she'll wait until I'm done, so I'm going to address those questions uh, when I'm finished. Okay. So apparently, uh, the next question is, well, if you want to apply for a PhD or a master's, well, which university should I consider? Right? And again, this is a general 
question. I will tell you what I would tell my undergrad students uh, who have been working with me. This is what I would tell them. Right? Uh, and, I, and again, I have to say, I encourage my undergrads to apply to different places, and, but that's just for me. Right? It be, because I think there's a value in looking beyond your alma mater. Right? If, if you want to apply for a PhD, it would be beneficial if you get sort of a, a, a slightly different experience. But again, that's, that's just me. Right? But in general, uh, your graduate education is, how fruitful it will be is determined by the person, the faculty member you closely work with. And many people don't realize that when they apply, they think, well, look at the ranking of the university, look at other you know, metrics or ask your friends. Yes, these are all useful indicators, but many people overlook one important aspect is who you would be working with if you go there for your PhD or master. And this is especially important for PhD because you'll be having a journey with that person for five to six years. It's a long term relationship. You need to be thinking about that. Right? So are there professors there who you know, I would like to work with? Right? So this is very important. Now for masters, it also matters because I would say the best way to get benefit from masters is to do a thesis. And if I don't do a thesis, since you're conducting some research within a one to two year time frame under a faculty advisor. So again, the people you'll be working with as your advisor is the most important factor that you have to think about. Right? So, so I would recommend you look at the home pages of those professors, a tenure track means you know, assistant professor or a tenured professor or associate and full professor. These are people, if you look at the title, if they are assistant, associate or full professors, and they are the people who can advise graduate students, uh, either PhD or masters. And look at their research areas, look at their you know, activities, you know, what they do in their group, in their lab, uh, where do they publish, uh, how active you know, are these pe people. So find out about this. And uh, this is very important, especially for PhD. Uh, you do want to know who you might be able to work with. If, if you look at one, uh, one department, you cannot even imagine there's any professor you can actually find their work to be interesting to you or don't apply because it's a waste of time because you, you will not really you know, find uh, you know, the resources that you'll be needing. Right? So that's something if you are still you know, in an early stage in terms of planning this, definitely go to look at their home, uh, home, home pages. Right? And if you are applying for a PhD, you know, definitely look beyond your alma mater uh, to apply to other places. Uh, you, you definitely also consider your alma mater because that can be a very good place to do your PhD because you know the people there, you, you have a much more higher confidence of you know, you, whether you'll be successful here or not, but you want to not restrict your option uh, for PhD application. Okay. And apparently my slides uh, had the same problem again. This must be a PowerPoint problem. Let me see if I can recover from that. So you can see my screen, right? So, and apparently I need to do some advertisement for uh, my department. So I'm, I'm sorry this picture just disappeared, but you probably know what, you know, where USF is. It's in Tampa. Uh, it's a nice metropolitan uh, area. Uh, I'm not sure if people can see my screen, probably not, but let me just quick, quickly skip to some fact about the place. Let me uh, do it here. So uh, sorry about the picture. I thought I fixed them, but then they just disappeared again. <laughs> so the Tampa Bay population is not a super big place, but you know it has a lot of uh, nice things about a uh, metropolitan area and it's not overly crowded, right? So it's, uh, you know, most of the places, uh, you know, you feel it's like a, at ease, right? We have also, you know, top beaches, you know, and the museum and theme parks, you know, it's only one hour drive to Disney and SeaWorld and probably 40 minutes drive to those nice beaches. So it's the location wise, it's pretty good, right? So again, my pictures are gone, uh, are gone again. Let me go through a few facts about the university. We have about 50,000 students from 145 countries. Uh, you know, there are rankings. Uh, so uh, people look at different kinds of rankings and they want to look at the US news ranking and look at the overall ranking and the departmental 
ranking and the ranking of majors, all of that. So these are definitely you know useful information, and I listed some of those rankings here. Uh, but uh, when you are thinking about your graduate school ranking, is just one component you should be thinking about, right? And you want to look at what's behind those rankings. Right? So what's the substance behind those you know positions? And to be honest, if you are looking at the U.S. news ranking, for for example, right? If not, definitely in the top ten makes a big difference. If you can go to one of the top ten, you know, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford. Uh, Harvard, you know, uh, Princeton, yeah, go for it, right? <laughs> but if you're uh, looking at, you know, the the more you, you go down the list, you go to the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, those rankings start to make, uh, uh, to become less useful for you to make a decision, right? So what is more useful, right? So that would require some homework on your end. So you need to look at the department, and look at what they have to offer you if, if you go there as a graduate graduate students. Let me see. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Okay, so I just want to make sure my screen sharing is uh, working as as expected. So nothing. Okay, good. I don't think there's anything problematic popping up here. I'm just looking at my message. So yeah, my PowerPoint. I think people have some problem seeing my PowerPoint slides. Okay, let me try it one, one more time. Maybe I can stop sharing for uh, to share again. Okay, so let me try to share my slides one more time. Okay, so it's a little bit weird why the, the slides have this issue. Right. Let me try to open it one more time. Yes. Sometimes the PowerPoint has those weird problem. Okay, let me go to the folder. Um, okay, let me open my slides one more time. Okay, so let me go to where I was. Let me share my slide one more time. PowerPoint. Okay, hopefully people can see my slide now. We can see them now. Um, they're not. Oh, there it is. Now it's full screen. It's the department, CSC department at USF. Yes. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. Okay. So this is where 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 I wanted to to be. Okay. So so here's our department. Uh, so if you look at our department, uh, so this is the basic. Information we have about we have 28 tenure tenure track faculty. So what I mentioned earlier, these are the people that can advise graduate students, right? So assistant professor, associate professor, or full professors. We currently we have about 100 PhD students enrolled. Right? So we have pretty you know, reasonable you know faculty to graduate uh, to PhD students ratio. I have about 100 master's students in, uh, enrolled and 2,000 undergraduate students. So I have the ranking here. Right. But what I want to say is to the last three bullets of our of the slides, right? look at the substance behind the ranking. So what actually, you know, what is there? Right. So just a ranking as a number doesn't mean much if you look at what the department has. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, if you look at the research performance data, right? the US News ranking is actually pretty, I would say, uh, reputation based. It's very subjective. Right? So they just ask, people in the field, how would you rank those places? They just, okay, based on their impression, they just give them rankings, so they just cross-source that uh, information from uh, many, many people in the field to just get their own ranking. But what is really what really ma matters for you is to look at what kind of research activities is there that you can benefit from if you go, if you go there to pursue a PhD or master's, right? So um, uh, we have, we're actually in the, you know, uh, top 20% in terms of uh, you know the research metrics. Now I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you in the next slide about you know, where where this uh, uh, coming from. And then we have 12 NSF career awardees. So what is NSF career? So NSF stands for National Science Found Foundation. It's probably the biggest federal funding agency for computer science research. Now we also have 
Department of Defense, uh, Homeland, Homeland Security. But in terms of the total amount of funding NSF rolled out every year to support computing related re research, NSF is leading. Right? And the career grants is a special type of award that is awarded to young faculty. So people who have been in the field, who have started their uh, faculty job within five years. Uh, yeah, I think in their first five years, so when they are still assistant professor. And these are the top young people in the field. Right? And as you all know, computer science is a, is a field for young people. Right? So having a large number of career awardees, these are people who either are current uh, holding a career grant or have been awarded career grants before. So 12 out of the 28 faculty. So this is a high ratio. Now you don't see uh, that kind of ratio in many places, right? And probably these are more like the you know, top ranked department, you know, the top 10, top 20, you, you'll see this kind of ratio, right? And we also have a number of fellows. Uh, a fellow means if someone has made you know, substantial contribution to the field. There are different uh, professional organizations like IEEE, uh, ACM, right? So then those people will be ele elevated to a fellow status when they have achieved the level of contribution. This is not easy to, uh, to, to, to obtain, right? So number of fellows is also one indication of how active the department research is. And also very important, what is the amount the research grant the, the department currently has. So we currently have about 16 million currently active research grants. Uh, that's about, if you look at, that's you know, more than half a million per tenure, tenure track faculty. It's a substantial amount. So why is that important? Well, we'll talk about you know, uh, you know, your, your work later. Having research grants means, or oh, these are all external grants. Or these are not from the university, these are from you know, federal agencies, industry, right? These are funding provided by agencies, either from the government or from industry, to support the universities for doing the research. So if you have those findings, it's an indicator that your research is impactful. People care about the research you do. They want to, they want to you know, put their money there, right? So it's not just saying you're doing nice work, but they're actually putting their money there for, to support you to do the research. And that leads to many other important you know, uh, uh, you know, factors for a student, because if, if you work on research grants, you get a much deeper exposure to the cutting edge technologies you know, nationwide and worldwide, because we are the US is leading the field uh, in the world. And so then you get to you know, go to meetings, conferences, you meet with other, uh, you know, other grants, uh, you know, PIs or uh, from other universities. So you will see what's, what's going on. What's the most cutting edge research in this country, uh, in the world, yeah, to be honest. So if you work on grants as part of your PhD or master's, then you get a much better experience, a much, uh, you know, much enriched experience in your research. Yeah. So now let me show you the research analytica that I uh, mentioned earlier, the first highlighted bullet here. And this is from data even a few years ago, and we should update this. Uh, if you look at, there are certain metrics on how well we are doing as a department. And then the percentile is where we stand overall in public universities. And keep in mind, we're not a very big department. Uh, we, are, we, are only, we only have 28 tenure, tenure track faculty. So we're not like, you know, uh, Illinois, which has maybe a hundred faculty member in the d department, right? So, but, but not that big. But then, if you look at the the absolute numbers, the federal grants we're getting, we are on the 66 percentile for a small, medium to small to medium sized department. The number of you know journal publications, conferences publication is on the you know 60s, 70s. Number of awards we are getting in recognition of our faculty research is in a close to 90 percentile. And the citation to our work is about 67. So this is a pretty impressive you know, you know, ranking. Look at the actual uh, substance, not just reputation, but actual substance. The what, what, what is our research outcome? 
Okay. Uh, so I have to apologize. The research areas slide, the picture is gone. Let me see if I could quickly recover that. I so just give me a quick uh, minute. Let me see if I can open that to copy paste from from the other slide. So let me do it really quick here. I don't know why it's keep doing this for me. It's a PowerPoint thing, I believe. So uh, we have, you know, a pretty diverse research portfolio, uh, pretty strong in AI and cognitive computing. That includes computer vision and pattern recognition and AI in general, machine learning, robotics. Uh, we also have a, you know, a faculty member doing a brain computer interface, pretty interesting, a fascinating field. Uh, computational neuroscience and effective computing. And these are really, really at the cutting edge of how AI is shaping our future. And, and we, we have faculty working in all of them. We have a large group of people working in cybersecurity, and I'm one of them. And that includes you know, all the typical you know, uh, subjects that you will see in cybersecurity. And we also have very multidisciplinary approach to it. We are collaborating with people from other colleges and departments, including anthropology, social science, uh, to attack the problem from a more holistic angle. Uh, people working on more efficient computing platforms that include computer architecture and you know, high performance computing, distributed com computing, and also biomedical devices. And very importantly, we have people working on the big data. Right? So, and that's sort of related to AI, but it's sort of its own thing. Right? So it has a very wide uh, area of application in biomedical imaging. And again, machine learning is very important here, and databases and social networks, how to understand you know, misinformation, disinformation, those kind of research, very, very cutting edge, and very timely as well. And all these research are done by faculty. Uh, we have also a lot of interdepartmental collaboration and also interdisciplinary collaboration with other departments and colleges and other universities as well. So what that means is if you uh, work here as a graduate student, you have the opportunity to collaborate with, you know, uh, in a very enriching environment with people from other departments, other universities, other colleges, and that also will, will be good uh, at, you know, for you. Okay, so I think my PowerPoint has some problem. One, one more time. Uh, I think it's the image problem. Let me see. Every time I try to share the screen, it has this issue. Okay, let me try to stop sharing again. Uh, why not I do this? All right, so, uh, let's see. Let me try to find out. Okay, uh, I will uh, I will email this to my producer, just in case. I I also I'll email this to Jessica, and in case this cannot be recovered, uh, I'll ask them to share the screen. Let me see if that slide is too big to email. Probably it's too big. Um, so Jessica, can you uh, try to? Uh, share the slides from your end. It's in the box folder. Um, I, okay. Yeah, right now I, I'm not sure if it's my PowerPoint problem or is you know other issue with the teams. So in the presentation, there's a Spring 21 COE Open House of PPTX, and if you can share your screen, and uh, Louis can uh, put the feed into the live. And then I can just talk and I'll ask you to play the slide to go to the next slide when the time when that's the time. Okay. okay. Which slide are we on now? The Spring 21 COE open house dot pptx. Right. Um, which number of slide do you want me to? Uh, let me see. Uh, slide 15. Yeah, I apologize for this. This has been a recurrent issue recently. I don't know what's going on. Okay, 
Okay, I think I, I shared it. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, we offer four graduate programs in our department. I have a PhD in computer science and engineering, and a master in computer science, a master in computer engineering, and a master of science in information technology. So next slide, please. So let's first talk about PhD. Uh, so what it takes to earn a PhD in our in our in our in our department, any, in any department for, for that matter. So it's pretty simple. Uh, you do excellent research under a faculty advisor, uh, leading up to a PhD dissertation, and that needs to be defended at the end of the five six years that that is spent here. Uh, so, uh, but we also have a a structure of doing this. Uh, so uh, we have certain early milestones. Uh, you, there are uh, three core courses people have to take, uh, after which uh, people have to take a qualifier exam. And these are not intended to be really, you know, uh, to try to fail people, but rather is to make sure uh, people who enter our, into the research have the basic uh, knowledge of the whole field of computing. Because many times people are overly focused on what they do for research, but they may not have covered you know, other areas you want to make sure even though you're doing in a particular research area, you are still covered in all the main, the important aspects of computing. So these are the, what the core courses are about and the qualifier, qualifier exam is about. This This is normally done in the first year or the first uh, couple years. And after this milestone is passed and people do a major research area paper presentation, and this is a, a opportunity for the student to explore you know, various research directions with their advisor and identify a direction that they want to spend some time on and produce some preliminary uh, results and present the finding to a, the PhD committee. And this is sort of a way for us to make sure, you know, to give a, you know, it's a, it's a tool we use to train our our students to do to do research. Okay. Many times this will lead to their PhD dissertation research. And sometimes this could be it could be different. Okay. Uh, but then uh, after the major research error is passed, then you just focus on your research uh, leading up to the defense. So I think this is uh, uh, this is also uh, important to point that we do provide uh, financial support for all PhD students in good standing. Uh, it's either in the form of teaching assistantship or research assistantship. Uh, in our college, the minimum pay rate for PhD is $25 per hour. Uh, normally you work no more than 20 hours a week because you have time to do your, uh, to, for, your for your study. Right? And so then if that translates to $1,000 bi-weekly at, at 20 hours per, per week. Uh, in addition, your tuition would be covered either from the grant or by the university, so you don't have to pay tuition. And you could also be in you know, other fellowships on top of that. So if you, uh, you know, earn a you know, certain university or a federal government fellowship, that can, can be even in addition to, you know, to, those, uh, to those assistantships. And we also, we also uh, offer health insurance for graduate, graduate, graduate students, you know, uh, so we also uh, subsidize the, the health insurance costs for, for graduate students who are in the TA or RA positions. So next slide, please. Okay, I think this is an, another slide where the pictures you know, went away. I think we can just go to the next one. So here, what I want to say, yeah, let's just continue for some reason those this PowerPoint that's just like weird. So uh, what we had here uh, are some uh, pictures of recent PhD graduates uh, who went on to work for various companies. Uh, so uh, if I had the pictures here, you will see it's pretty diverse. Uh, we have, uh, I can give you some example from my own, from my own, own students. Right? So uh, uh, some of them, so one went to Google as a, uh, you know, as a researcher, right? so, but then he actually worked on uh, the real problem. So what, what Google uh, does to protect the Android uh, App Store, Google Play, for example. Right? So that's that's exactly what he did for his, for his 
PhD. Uh, so uh, for him, that was a pretty rewarding experience. He was able to use exactly what he, you know, what he was doing as his PhD research in his job. And he felt really, really great about that. And the other of my PhD students, he went on to work for a startup for a couple of years. And then he now, after you know, a couple of years of experience in Silicon Valley, now he uh, was sort of like a post, right? Or he was actually, he moved up uh, to work for a major company, uh, Netflix. I, I'm sure you all know that. At a pretty senior position uh, in, uh, in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, so he was able to get there because his research, uh, he was able to get the first job in the startup because of his research. And then he was able to get onto the much higher level of senior position, also partially because of what he did in his in the graduate school. Uh, so it does matter. So it's, it's no longer that you just have this uh, title. It's what you do. Uh, what you do in research, either in PhD or master, uh, that which make, makes the difference in your career path down the road. So now I switch gears to talk about masters. Right? So we have a three different masters pro program. The first one is Master of Science in Computer Science. And like in the PhD program, uh, there are three core courses that have to be taken. The, the three courses are here. And beyond that, there are two tracks. Now you can take the thesis track. Right? Then that means you, there will be a nine credit hour for thesis research. You'll be working with a faculty member. Uh, on some research topic uh, in about a year or two's time. And then, you know, you defend your thesis just like you would defend your PhD dissertation. But again, because the time frame is much shorter, so we're not going to be asking for the same level of contribution as a PhD, but it has to be an original novel contribution in the field. Right? And then in addition to that, there are four courses besides the three core courses that have to be taken to fulfill the credit R requirements. Now, if you take the non-thesis track, there'll be seven elective in addition to the three core courses. And that's also add up to about the same number of credit hours. Um, so I have to say that, you know, uh, if, if I were you, right, if, if I were you trying to think about doing a thesis, doing a master's, I would do a thesis. Uh, if that master's offer the thesis option, I'll definitely take the thesis option, to be sure. Uh, simply because that's the thing that ultimately will, you will be able to gain that is that is different than what you'll be gaining from undergraduate education, is to do research. Uh, you normally would not be able to find a lot of opportunity for doing research. There are some, but not it's not a norm. Uh, the graduate school is, is, is the opportunity that you may have for a lifetime to do some research. Uh, so take that, take, take that opportunity if you want to do a master, uh, do a thesis option, and that will help you down the road tremendously. So next slide, please. And we also have a master of science in computer engineering. So the only difference is that the core courses are different. There are only two of them. So as a result of that, the the overall number of uh, of electives uh, is one course more. There's also a thesis option there. Okay. So next slide, please. And here are some some of the example elective courses for you know either for PhD, you know, Master of uh, Computer Science, and Master of Computer Engineering. And again, if you are really thinking about graduate school, right, uh, courses is not the the most important thing. I mean, you still want to do well in, in the courses, but you should be thinking about doing research, right? And and we we. Uh, for our PhD students, PhD they are all doing, so after they are done with the first couple milestones, all they do is research. Uh, they'll spend two or three years just focus on their research and they publish and they go to conferences, they present to other people, they you know, uh, work on funded uh, grants and all of that. So this is the, the way you gain the most valuable experience from graduate school. Uh, but not just so you know, you can also have a lot of interesting courses that you want to learn, maybe even beyond your research area. There are many of them. Right? So that, that this is not this is the in, incomplete list. Uh, we offer a large, you know, selection of of electives for our PhD, masters, and you know, master students. Next slide, please. 
So the third master's degree we have is Master of Science in Information Technology. And this degree program is actually ranked very high by US News. Uh, uh, I think we are ranked number 10 in the country for Master of Science in Information Technology. And there are three core courses. These are different from all, so all the three master's programs have different core courses. And there are also uh, you know, seven elective co courses for information technology because the you know the future career path for people in this degree is more towards on um, the operation and management of IT systems. So we that for that reason uh, we think it would be beneficial for people to also have some exposure to uh, you know courses in a psychology of business or maybe other departments because you have to deal with a lot of you know social human organizational uh, challenges uh, in uh, in those Careers. And not to say these are not important for other, but uh, for the uh, for the MSIT, this is especially pronounced uh, that we that need to have that kind of ex exposure. So for the seven elective courses, uh, you know, some could be taken from out of our out of our department. Uh, you can benefit from you know, business courses or even from some other department courses as well. Next slide, please. Uh, here are some of the our own departmental elective courses for MSIT. Now for MSIT, we don't have a thesis option, so it's just coursework. Uh, some people choose to have some to like a. Uh, I think we we, we, have, we have we have had people to who want to get involved in research with faculty. I, I would highly recommend that uh, because again, even though there's no no requirement for Having a thesis, you can still get involved in research by, you know, working with the faculty member, either as a you know, formal course or maybe just as something you, you do on the side. Right? It, it, it can even be a paid position if, if you are creating a, a good contribution for research grant, for example. So next slide, please. And again, let's skip this. These are some. Pictures are, are, are lost for some reason. You cannot see them. There are pictures. These are our recent MS graduates. You can see where they have gone to recently. Uh, you know, in different companies, uh, so on and so forth. So next slide, please. And we also have people who earn uh, many awards and scholarships nationwide. Uh, so if you uh, look at the slide, uh, we have, you know, the, uh, many of them are very very competitive, like Microsoft Research Dissertation Grant, right? And we also have Sloan Fo Fo Foundation Fellowship, and the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. These are pretty competitive grants uh, to to got. And, and we also have people who actually, if, if you work on funded project from NSF, you can also apply for you know NSF travel grant. And these are good things to have because even though your advisor could pay for your trip to travel to a conference, but you can also apply for a travel grant from the funding agency. That, in addition to being paid for the travel, you also get an award you can put on your resume. So that's another you know, advantage of, of actually having, uh, you know, having you know, being able to work on a on a research grant funded by you know, federal agencies like NSF. So next slide, please. So in terms of application, uh, we have the priority deadline for the fall has just passed, uh, January 15, uh, and then you know for the spring is sometimes the first. The final deadlines, which means we will not be able to you know fully consider the application after the final deadline for PhD is February 15, uh, Masters is June the first, and uh, for the spring will be October the 15. So you know you can find all this information from our website. Uh, and please go to the next slide. I think I have some URLs there. Oh yeah, so I have to talk about what is the requirement for application. So in in our in our department, I would look at each application as a whole. We, we, we don't say only look at your transcript or only look at your GIE or TOEFL if you are international. We look at the whole thing as a package. I uh, see, you know, what well, when we read an application, the faculty member who is reviewing it, we try to form a picture of this person and see where this person can fit into our 
in, in, into our program. Right? Uh, you know, none of this, you know, I can say what's, what's really the cutoff. We do have a minimum requirement for GRE, right? And also, you know, TOEFL, the university has certain requirement for language proficiency, but, you know, we always look at the application as a whole. Right? And, and, you know, uh, all these pieces of information are going to be very, uh, very important. So, uh, you know, so, so that's something probably is the same if you apply to any place, right? You want to uh, get your package in a good form. Uh, so to, to be, it'll be, it, it'll be uh, informative to people to, to read, to, say, to, to see you as a person, uh, whether we can find you a good home here. The next slide, please. So here are the useful links. Right? So our faculty page is on the top. So if you are interested in our department, please go there to look at the the, the faculty members uh, and, and then also particularly uh, the tenure track and tenure faculty, you know, professors, assistant associate or full professors. Uh, we also have a graduate pro program information there if you are going to look at the more details on the milestone, the requirement, the deadline, things like that. And, and we also have information on how to apply. And there is a page for you know, our alum, people who have graduated from our graduate program, they, they want to share with you know, uh, the future generation on what their experience was. And many of them are pretty, uh, pretty insightful. I, I, I have watched a, a few, I think they have, you know, they share their really, uh, a lot of time we, uh, it has been a long time since I was graduate student. So, so it, it's actually, it's good to hear from the students themselves as to what they think is, is the most uh, important thing they learned uh, here. Okay. So here are the links. I think the next slide is the Q&A. Yes. Okay, so now I'll see if there are any questions that uh, I can answer. Um, we don't have any yet. There were a couple, but I already answered them. So if anybody yeah. has any questions, you can go ahead and type them in. Okay. So right. I think the next slide. Okay, yeah. Jessica, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, if there's no additional questions, uh, could you go to the last slide? I think the last slide has some information for, for them to, uh, to for them to, to know where to go next. Yeah. So the next session is in about uh, well, there's still more than you know, 40 minutes left. Right? So you can you can leave uh, this Teams live event and then you can then you return to your program. You can choose campus tour and click on the name to access the Teams link event for the session. So all the sessions are recorded, so you can visit another department at a later date after the recording has been posted. So let's see if there are any questions. Okay. So I think if not, I think we can uh, we can end this session for now and hope you enjoy the rest of your your tour here.
So we can end? Yes. Okay.